So, yeah. Marty, thanks so much. I agree. We really have a good panel here and a, a lot of different perspectives. Um, again, I'm George Lee, partner here at Carrington. I think by now you know me, but uh, just briefly, sorry. Is this better? This better? Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, anyway, my practice is fund formation, corporate securities, private placements, and also SEC regulatory compliance. And I want to introduce my three panelists. First of all, virtually is Charles Preston. Are you in Austin today, Charles? Yes, I am. Can you guys see me okay? We can see and hear you. Oh, very great. Well. So, well, you're, you're a handsome group of guys there. I wish I was with you. I wasn't feeling 100%, so I didn't think it would be a good idea to go up there and infect the whole world in 25 days by, by you guys. So, yeah, I'm here. I, I appreciate, the, uh, I appreciate the, the, the intro. Do you want me just to talk a minute about our background? Is, is yeah, uh, yeah, you can talk about your background. Um, I know you're a reformed lawyer. I wish I was one too, but um, <laughs> we... <laughs> you got time, George. You got time. <laughs> no, I, that's my next career. Um, but yeah. no, tell us a little bit about your background and about Harris Preston. Sure. So, uh, uh, you know, George has been a great friend of the firm for a long time, a very capable um, corporate finance lawyer, and especially on Investment Company Act, where we work, mostly work with George. My background is corporate finance and securities law. Is a I was a lawyer at Vincent and Elkins back in the 90s, did a lot of corporate finance uh, and M&A, ended up joining a client, the University of Texas Office of Asset Management, which became Utemco. Um, it, was a, it was a great time to be there, had a lot of money. My, that's when I say my jokes were the funniest and people returned my calls the quickest. I don't, I'm not sure what happened, but ended up rolling out of there, launching Harris Preston. Uh, really leveraging the uh, kind of know-how gained at Utemco from focusing on co-investments. Uh, at, at UT, we were trying to do 80% funds and 20% co-investments alongside the funds. And uh, Harris Preston has it flipped. You know, we're doing more like 10 or 20% in funds, 80% in co-investments. A little different model. We give our families, we work with about uh, 110 or so families that uh, are investing with us. And then we work with about 40 private equity firms, uh, provide us deal flow. We kind of sit between the two. And, uh, and what we're trying to do is give our families the opportunity to invest in co-investments uh, on a one-off basis. So they can really build their own portfolio. So we've been doing this since about 2006. We've We've done about 130 co-investments. We've invested in about 40 different private equity funds, about 30 something different firms. And uh, yeah, we're having a lot of fun. We're, we're blessed to work with great partners. And you know that, that's an overriding theme of our business. We're trying to work with really good partners, really good private equity firm par partners who tend to be good partners themselves with their underlying management teams. Uh, and then obviously a really great group of uh, family partner, uh, partners where we're, you know, right alongside them investing in the deals. My, my partners and I, Ron Harris and William Glasgow are the largest or second largest investor uh, in our, in our co-investments. So, so that's the high level. Thank you, Charles. Uh, John, why don't you go next, introduce yourself. Sure. Thank you, George. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm John Langston. I'm the founder of Republic Capital Group. We are an investment banking firm that serves the wealth and asset management community. We have uh, a number of clients with literally thousands of families as uh, Charles described. And uh, we have historically been very involved in structuring you know, private investments, um, have helped uh, set up partnerships with global managers for you know, sort of in-house manager of those structures. And then we often, uh, particularly in our space, are seeing a lot of interest in direct investing into wealth or asset management firms. And of course, that's our ecosystem. So uh, when I had a chance to connect with Marty, this was really interesting. So appreciate the opportunity and, and uh, looking forward to talking. Great. And uh, last but not least to my left is, is Sal. How do you pronounce your last name? Are you any relation to Steve? So, Sal Buscemi. So, 
So I've been here, I'm the CEO and co-founder of HRN LLC, which is a multifamily office, but I've been following Marty around for about 20 years under the Danger nominative, uh, under the Danger name, which is basically a nomenclative homage to my uh, maternal grandfather, who was a hotelier, but also he was also president of the American Hotels Association. I'm a real estate guy, but I don't have any, you know, hotels. Um, since leaving Goldman Sachs, I had two institutional distressed funds. Um, right now, I have a smaller balance under the Danger name uh, called Danger Partners Encore Ventures. And that has a lot of life science names into it. And it's a funny story because of Marty. Um, I think he sent someone out many years ago and he said, there's this crazy guy named Sal from Goldman that lives out in Vegas. He just had some exits and some distressed commercial real estate deals and everything. And that's how I met one of my partners, Bill Workmister. And then that's how we started Encore Ventures. And now we have, I'm the CEO of what we call HRN. And HRN essentially is the partnership between partner, uh, Bill Workmister, myself, and Albert Ewan. And those two guys are life science rock stars. Um, Albert himself used to manage $6 billion for liquids and life sciences for Rockefellers, which is important. Bill himself has significant life science uh, you know, accomplishments and uh, very deep relationships that's been able to have us build a portfolio of some of the more important, sorry, some of the more name brand companies today in life sciences. And I'll just for a few of them. And it was interesting listening to Heather talk earlier because a lot of the investors that we have today are kind of newer. We call them emerging families. And what they're looking for is something that they're not able to find elsewhere. And that's sort of like legitimacy today because we live in a very conspicuous society. So people want to be able to show that my real estate deal is nicer than yours. I'm smarter. My CEOs have like Tom, for example, has seven unicorns, yours has none. So we're in a very comparative culture today, whether or not we like to say it or not, but status really drives it. And really what we merchant in, because a lot of these deals that we're in is because a lot of these families like the notoriety to be able to go out there and tell their families that, yes, we're not in these you know, class B, class C to class B value added multifamily deals. We're in like a world-class industrial facility, for example, an Amazon center in Southern Nevada, where I live in Las Vegas currently. So we've done a lot of that. We've also done some other things too, as it relates to AI. We invested in a company behind uh, Raptor. And a lot of the investments we make are behind world-class family offices. So Pricity Health has Dr. James Allison, for example, as the CEO. He was a Nobel Prize winner for oncology in 2018. But we have the Emerson Collective, which is Lorraine Jobs' family office and Tito's Family Vodka. Also, these are healthcare companies that also cross into other things too, but it gives our families a sense of certainty and safety because all risk is human. Um, some of the names that we've been into, just to go over, is Apricity Health, Immunicom, which is a big one. And I can thank Marty for that. Biotechnology, SciTech Development. We're in Allen's Art Fund. Um, we kicked off the... There's sort of a story here, and I'm, people don't know this, but I've written three books, and one of which, um, when we launched the family office, is that we wanted to have a narrative to go with. And what we did was we went with an ex-boss of mine at Goldman Sachs who, gave, who was a partner <laughs> on the investment committee who gave a, a heck of a testimonial in exchange for investing in his company behind Apollo. So we follow the knitting here when we make these investments. We're always following smart families into it because that gives us, you know, that gives families certainty. And if you think about the extreme environments that we've been through over the past two years since the pandemic, we've had, you know, a tremendous amount of success. So that's where I am. And I thank Marty for this because I've been following him for years. And if it wasn't, you know, I'm a distressed real estate guy by trade, but things got boring. And I think the first deal I did was when you sent Bill Workmister out and we've done a lot of deals. And I just want to make sure people who are listening to this is that, Marty's a very, very good filter for the deals that come through. And if you go to hrn.llc, you'll see some of the names there. And um, if you email me, sal at hrn.llc, I can give you a list of other things that are in my fund. But a lot of them have been originated through Marty. And for that, we're grateful. I just want to make sure, you know, give him a round of applause if you can. All right. Thank you, Marty. So I hope that wasn't, but here we I didn't find it boring. In fact, I was uh, glad to hear that Tito's Vodka is a health food. Well, they're fixing the problem here. Okay, good. Uh, so, Charles, I have a, a few questions for you, which I think will be of interest to everyone on the panel. Uh, I know you like you have your great families that you work with. Um, why do they like the lo lower middle market space and not not the venture or other spaces? Sure. Well, you know, that, that's uh, that's all we do. There's a, a lot of places to invest out there. And where we just, you know, really focused is uh, 
small and middle market sponsors and companies. We did a lot of work at UT, which is kind of, we've carried it forward and it really is a supply and demand issue. You know, there's just a lot more companies at the smaller end of the market. I mean, literally millions of companies, kind of less than a hundred uh, employees. And, uh, and as you know, the bigger you get, uh, candidly, the way our markets work here in the, in the United States and, and, in, and in, well, really all over the world is most of the money's, you know, uh, congregated at the top of the market and uh, most of the companies are at the bottom end of the market. So I think the last I saw there was like 82% of private equity raised really focuses on, you know, funds that deploy, you know, greater than a billion dollars. So, so the multi hundred million dollar and billion dollar companies is where most of the money is. And we just, we focus on the smaller market. I mean, we, we won't do anything really over about 600 million in, in transaction value, but we do a lot of fifties and 75s and hundreds and that kind of thing. And, and I just think that uh, a lot of the families we work with are not institutional, you know, they're not multi-generational family offices that look like institutions. They're, they're oftentimes, you know, small families making investment decisions with a lot of wealth or they have, you know, a very successful company and they're taking money from their cash flow, their businesses and, and trying to build a diversified portfolio. And I think they, I think they identify with and like these companies better, you know, the smaller companies that have maybe greater opportunities to improve when a, a very high quality private equity firm works with them, greater opportunities to improve them, to grow them, uh, to professionalize them. And then, you know, as, as we all know, the private equity markets are really set up like uh, kind of like the baseball system, you know, you have a middle school, high school, college, single A, double A, triple A, you know, baseball. And, and we're down in the smaller end. We're in, we're in college, we're in, we're in high school and, and we're selling to single A, triple A and majors. So uh, as you get higher up in the, uh, the larger deals, the most managers are underwriting to a lower return threshold, you get into the bigger deals. Guys are trying to get 12 to 15% type returns. Our guys are still trying to get, you know, 25 to you know, to 30 or more. So it's just a stratified market. I think most of our families like the smaller uh, side of the market. Uh, I think it's returns, but I also, you know, we do about 10 deals a year or so. And so we're always seeing another interesting company. You know, it'll be a software company this month and next month it'll be an industrial manufacturer, then a distribution and then a consumer. And I, I, they like the diversification. They like the kind of steady uh, stream of high quality, uh, smaller companies that have really good managers. So I hope that answers the question. It does, thanks. Um, the next question is for Sal, but I think it's a question for, for the panel, but I'll let you start off Sal talking about um, whether the two and 20 model is broken. Do you still see that as a, a model or? Oh, well, the, the families today, even the emerging ones, there's there's been a negative normative connotation now with you know people sitting on assets, not really doing a lot of performance. And they're sitting saying to themselves, I'm paying 2%, what do I get? I get to see you buying all this fancy artwork on Park Avenue. And so what we've done is, and, and I wrote about this in my third book, Investing Legacy, but people are fee conscious today. And in order to make sure that people don't come across as, and people don't use the P word of family offices, but your pro, family office has to be profitable. And so we put together a very symmetric fee structure where the guppies, you know, maybe the smaller ticket investors are not being subsidized by the whales and the freight and voyage across the duration of the investment. So we put it together that it's very symmetric in a way and also that they don't get diluted. We, we basically bang it back to the CEOs and their shareholders to, so that we don't show any dilution in you know, the capital table for our investors when they log into the administrator, which is important. But also I think too, is that you gotta show conviction, even though we're putting um, money into these deals and I've seeded a lot of these, is that we, we went to show how the investors were gonna make out on the back end so quickly that it would go right through the frontal cortex and they would understand it. And I basically explained it as saying, we have to pay you 200% before we make a profit. So our splits on our deals for our direct venture deals are uh, 200 and then a 50-50. So I have to give you $2 back before I make a profit. And that shows a lot of conviction, especially in the names, you know, but when you're working with people like Tom at Thrive, you can do something like that because the investors will see that certainty of execution in the past and the track record. Got it. So you're not taking a, a management fee? We are taking a smaller management fee. It's smaller. I think it's about 125 basis points. Got it. That's it. But that's just, to, you know, to pay for the administration. A lot of the fees that we come in, come into us are um, mostly on the back end on the carry, but are mostly on the, um, the fees from the company for putting the deals together. 
Right. Um, so Charles, turning to you, I know you guys have, uh, you're on your fourth program now, you have a fund of funds that uh, is kind of the flagship of the, of the program. However, most of the, the investor interest in the juice comes from the co-investments. How do you deal with your, your sponsors and their two and 20 model and, and the fact that, you know, in some instances, there are two layers of fees. Um, I understand, you know, a lot of your families uh, wouldn't get a lot of deal flow on their own because they're not putting enough into these sponsor funds. But tell me, you know, how you've solved that, that problem. Yeah, no, no good question. I, I do think, I do think families are very sensitive on fees. Uh, I, I agree with a lot of sales comments. I'm glad to see he's come up with some different alternatives that the, the market's been so locked into the two and 20 for so long. It, it, it kind of makes sense when you have a few hundred million under management, you need to run your business, but you know, when you're multi billions and you're still taking the two and 20, I think, you know, our interests can, can diverge. And so uh, it's always good to see. And I know candidly in the last five years, I've seen a lot more, you know, alternatives to the typical two and 20 model. We, we, we came up with a model that's a little different. Our funds are, they're really not the flagship, the funds, uh, fund of funds that we manage are, are what I would call the tail of the dog. You know, it, you need to participate in the, in the private equity uh, fund of funds to get access to the program. And then, you know, we try to do three to five times that amount in co-invests. And so if you're in the program, that means you made a commitment to the fund and uh, we have fees, no carry uh, on that, on that fund of funds that helps keep the lights on. But then we have uh, carried interest on the co-invest, but no fees. And so what that means is we don't have that large fee uh, uh, burden, which really hurts your returns. In a typical private equity fund, you might invest 80 or 85 cents in the deal when you factor out the fees, which means if you make a three times return, you really make a 2.4. Whereas what we're trying to do on the co-investments is basically invest all the money in the company. So a three times the money is a three times the money, not diluted uh, down to 2.4, 2.3. Uh, and and you know, our program's different too, in that we give our, our uh, our investors discretion over the co-invest. So we, we have a number of investors that, you know, have a million dollars in the fund, for example, and they may, they might have $20 million in co-investments. They're 20 to one, you know, and, and in that case, then they're just paying a carried interest to us. We have a 17 and a half carried interest, but 17 and a half carry with no management fees, uh, you know, is a, is a, when you, when you kind of juxtapose a typical fund structure versus the way we're doing it, you know, the way we do it, you know, usually generates somewhere between, uh, you know, a third to uh, uh, more than a half extra turn. So, you know, a, a two and a half will become a three. So I, I think structure matters. I think, I think more families are focused on fees. I think the idea of funding a bunch of fees and no activity is uh, frustrating. I think uh, candidly, a lot of families we work with are, are equally concerned with, uh, they, don't, they don't like uh, uh, non-discretionary pools. They, they would rather have a say if they're going to be in the investment or not. And so, you know, we, we ended up kind of crafting a program based on some of the preferences that we had as families. And, and, you know, and that led to this model where most of our deals, you know, they, they can opt in or out on a per deal basis and they're just going to be paying a carry, but it's, it's a, it's clearly a key issue with families, with everyone. And I, I think, you know, that this, this capture by some of the larger private equity firms, of, uh, of, of convincing big institutions to continue with the two and 20, it's uh, hats off to them, but candidly, I scratch my head about that sometimes. Do, do, do the families have to participate? So I, I think I know the answer, um, uh, Charles, Marty's question was, do the families have to participate in the fund of funds? Is that in, in the fund of funds or? Right, so how does their participation in the fund of funds relate to their allocation of co investments Yeah, yeah, great question. So, you know, um, we have a cap table of investors for our partnership, for our, our fund of funds. And whatever ownership you have of the fund is what your initial allocation is for your co-investment. 
And so, you know, if you're a very small investor in the fund and we have a very small co-investment, you know, your initial allocation may be five, ten thousand dollars know, could be very small. But, you know, because we have 100 families and because families all kind of act differently, think differently. And because candidly, uh, you know, these families are out and about, not always focused on the program. Normally, a third of our investors uh, aren't going to participate in any one deal. And then there's another third that maybe take half in their allocation, which opens up a lot of allocation for guys that are small in the fund. I mean, we, we've literally had situations. It also, of course, depends on the, the size of the co-investment we get initially. I mean, if we have a $20 million co-investment to start, that's a lot different than if we have a $3 million co-investment. But we have situations where families are at a million or uh, half a million dollars in our fund, and they'll do $5 million or more in one co-investment. You know, if there's allocation, you know, if other families pass, which opens up allocation. So, you know, we're, we're candidly, we're building a book 10 or 15 times a year every time we do a co-invest. And there are situations when we're over allocated, we, we, we guide our investors to ask for what they want, not really what their allocation is, but ask for what you want. We'll try to make it happen. And, and usually we're pretty good at that. But we get a deal that everybody likes and it's a small co-invest, you know, people aren't going to get their entire allocation they want. In some respects. Yeah. Um, so just going back, I know Sal, you wanted to chime in a little more on the fee structure. Uh, John, did you want to add to that? Yeah. I would just say that uh, all the things that Sal and Char uh, Charles talked about, I'm seeing as well, maybe a slight nuance uh, in our world, we're seeing a lot of pooling, grouping of investors since our, our ecosystem has large blocks of investors and they're expressing it in a couple of ways. One, they're you know achieving access to some managers that are difficult to achieve and ultimately getting a discount for all of their, their clients, all right? Just to, you know, you're with a great manager at a discounted rate. And then secondly, doing a lot of pooling and charging no carry, no incentive fee and just having a asset management fee below 1%. So that's pretty attractive too. I think all that's achieved just because of the, the volume of, um, of investors that they might have in a particular situation. A little, little different nuance, but, but, uh, but uh, interesting as well. I think it's, it's important to be innovative when you're talking to families today, when it comes to fees, because everybody in the family office structure thinks not everybody's a family office, right? Some of them are broker dealers and drag. I think we can, you know, I think we can agree with that. But one of the things that we do, I, I like to show and tell. And for example, we're in Alan's art fund a lot. Um, Alan Snyder, who was here yesterday. And one of the things we have is a flat rate. If you want to join, it's a flat rate. All you can eat. Because what happens when you start investing over a million dollars, you actually make 85 basis points more. So it's, it's sort of like a, a construct, if you will, to get the investor to put more in because he'll see time that he's going to be making more money. So this is the kind of innovation that we work with, but you have to work with smart guys like Alan to pull it off, right? And smart lawyers too, of course, such as your help. But that's just, an, that's just like an idea hack that you know, we've used, but the investors like it because they see what they're, you know, we basically copy and paste the Excel spreadsheet, put in the email, this is it. Do you like it or not? Yes. Do you need help with the model? Here it is. Knock yourself out. That's it. That's great. Uh, let's see, moving on another, another topic. Uh, so John, I know you work with a lot of uh, private equity firms and wealth management firms. What are you seeing in terms of direct investment opportunities in the wealth management business? Yeah, may, may or may not be that applicable for some of you, but in the wealth management, asset management space, particularly wealth, we've seen tremendous growth of assets moving. And I would put in that bucket sort of a lot of family offices. One of our largest clients is, uh, is a family office client, but they're north of 35 billion assets. Obviously, there are a number of families in, in that group, so multifamily, if you will, a little, little different expression, but they are typical families, 100 million plus. Uh, and so we're watching, seeing what they're doing around, uh, around the space. But there's been a tremendous interest uh, from private equity to invest in, in that space and take positions in firms like that all, all up and down the spectrum. And we've encountered a number of family offices who, who have interest in investing in the space. And then conversely, we have a whole group of clients who would much rather take capital from the family office space than a large private equity group. A lot of our clients, whether they be a, you know, in a sort of family office construct or, you know, maybe serving different clients, came out of a large, you know, broker dealer or wirehouse, UBS Merrill Lynch, great institutions, but just a different dynamic. And so it's a little bit anathema to them to say, I'm going to take, you know, um, 
capital from this global private equity firm. I, I personally have been involved in a couple of uh, large firms with capital from global private equity firms, and it certainly can be an advantage. But so there's a real appetite on our client base, people that we represent uh, for the, the type of direct investment. What I tend to hear from groups, and I'm thinking of a, of a very large Chicago family who finally made their, their um, first investment in our space. We had been talking the last four years, and the, the, their comment in out searching for opportunities was every time we get involved, we're getting outbid or they're just hard to find and buy PE opportunities. So, but, but uh, we definitely have a, a core group of clients and, and uh, potential clients that say, hey, bring me someone from the family office space. I would be much more intrigued with partnering with them. So that's, that's something that's, that's interesting. Are, are you seeing a slowdown with the market correction? Is there a bid ass spread, you know, between what guys want for their businesses and uh, and what buyers are willing to pay? Yeah, so a couple of interesting nuance there. So if you're a high quality firm, meaning good growth, good margins, good client base, uh, no, we've seen no correction in pricing. At the very top end, we, we have a very large dynamic with, um, you know, very large, it is a PE group making the investment. You know, they're being impacted a bit by where uh, interest rates have moved, right? Because they're going to fund some of the transaction with debt. So that's, that's had an impact on the valuation discussion. Still very strong. For a firm that has challenges either around growth or the number of people involved as far as infrastructure, that kind of thing, yes, there's been an impact on what investors are willing to, how to, how to value those businesses. But by and large, the underlying demographics of the space in terms of the wealth transfer generationally, the movement of assets from these traditional large platforms <laughs> over to this sort of independent format uh, are, are demographic underpinnings that are not going to be changed by these market movements. And so uh, along with the fact that through COVID, these firms and these types of firms perform tremendously well. And I was sharing with someone out in the hall who's, who's active in, in deploying capital that what we, you know, you have an industry where it's not um, asset backed in the way that traditional lending looks at. But now the, the retention of client, his, his story is so strong. Um, the, the cash flow dynamic of the industry is so strong, along with growth. It's become tremendously appealing. And that's what has drawn uh, so much private equity uh, dollars. And we have just, just in the last few days, a brand new global venture made their first and best space, a global group. And uh, so, uh, but we're not, for high quality firms, not seeing a change in, in valuation. So to follow up on that a little bit, I have several clients actually who are wealth managers founded by three or four guys in the 70s or 80s, and they're approaching their 70s or 80s. And they're either looking to sell or they're looking to, to bring on some younger wealth managers. Uh, how does that impact valuation? Do you see roll-ups of, of firms in the space? I guess the private equity groups probably get more involved in you know, management shakeups or then the family offices would. Yeah, look, it's a, it's a very dynamic space. And I am sensitive to the fact that this is an area I'm focused on. So I don't want to take all the time. I want to be courteous to others, but very dynamic space in terms of, for someone like you described, they would have a broad range of, of potential capital partners for all the reasons you articulated succession with the next generation, an acquisition, a merger with someone else. But it would range from truly, I mean, uh, global, the, the firm I was involved with had an investment from the Carlisle Group, right? Second largest, at least at that time, PE firm in the world. I don't know if they're number one now. I've been checking. But so they were involved in a wealth management business. Um, and, and frankly, that, that, that company was the top performing company in the entire portfolio of financial services. So kind of interesting dynamic. Uh, small investment, they treated us like we were rock stars. It, it was great. But uh, uh, so they would have that choice all the way down to, again, a, a private family, um, you know, saying, hey, I, I love the idea of I'm going to invest in the wealth management space. Most of the wealthier families have a pretty good sense about how dollars and opportunities should be managed. And so they can they can be, be uh, a great partner. But the growth of those firms, the valuation of those firms, the profitability of the firms, um, continue to increase. We're, we're seeing a very large impact of technologies having on this space. Um, and if you think about some of the issues around financial services and technology, the legacy firms have huge embedded costs around changing to the latest technology, a Bank of America, for example. Some of our clients are, you know, seven, eight years old, manage a plus, hundred plus billion dollars. They can institute any technology they want for much, much lower cost structure. So we tend to find much more cutting edge technology with our clients, even in some of the old line firms. Uh, like a Merrill Lynch, that kind of thing. So, um, but I think that's that's uh, some of the opportunity they have. Got it. And um, getting back to the direct investment topic, 
are you seeing opportunities for families and others to invest directly, but alongside bigger, stronger investors? I mean, historically, right, in our world, we were much more familiar with the traditional, you know, private investment groups, um, you know, being driven by institutional dollars. What we see across the board from every sort of notable, you know, uh, private equity, private uh, investment group is a tremendous appetite for families and individuals to invest now. So we're seeing sort of the behind the scenes, you know, uh, one-off agreements that, you know, uh, a large family, a large group of collection family offices can have discounted pricing. They can have things that historically just weren't there. You know, the old joke was it used to be that if someone significant brought an opportunity to you, they've already shopped it everywhere on Wall Street and everywhere else. That's changing. There is a direct core strategy that says we will take more attractive things because we, the, the belief is that, that this market will be larger than the institutional market as we progress forward the next 20 years. So yes, definitely seeing that. We we structured for uh, a large firm uh, with a global firm, uh, you know, their institutional level pricing, access to management, everything. Uh, and it was very effective and, you know, very well received. Again, I think there's a, there's a real desire. Obviously, you still have to be careful in terms of, um, you know, has this, is this a transaction opportunity that's been passed on by all the institutional groups? But there are a number of significant players that are intentionally taking some of their best opportunities to the individual slash, you know, wealthy family marketplace. And we're seeing that firsthand. Great. Thanks. Uh, Charles, turning back to you for a second, um, you raised the, the question about what are you seeing as far as economic impacts? What are you seeing as, you know, some of the challenge sectors in the small and middle market, which are overperforming? Are investors getting nervous about investing in, in private equity firms that probably have a lot of dry powder right now? Yeah, uh, good question. You know, uh, I, I guess I would make a couple of comments, generally speaking, and, and, and kind of a couple words that come to mind are uncertainty and caution. You know, we're just seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of reflection, cautiousness, uh, and so that's kind of a general comment, I, I would say, on the markets that, that we work in. Uh, I wouldn't say fear, but certainly real caution and uncertainty. And that usually slows things down, of course. And then, you know, when you get into our market, because we really work across the economy in terms of different industries and sectors, you know, you really can start drawing some distinctions. So, for example, um, consumer discretion getting hit pretty hard you know uh, consumer discretion businesses are getting hit pretty hard uh, I, I think you know that part of the economy is probably the most concerned and cautious but industrial and manufacturing and uh, tech enabled services some of the other things we do a lot in you can't even tell giant backlogs a lot of business so it just depends so what we like to talk about is we're, we're, we're not macro investors we're micro investors we're you know, 10, 15 times a year, we're making an individual decision on a discrete business in a discrete sector. And, and so, you know, we, uh, we're, we're doing one right now. It's a, it's an industrial business. It's doing very well. It's in a high growth sector. It's kind of an ESG related. And then it works with, it works with uh, kind of making landfills safer. And it, you know, it produces products relating to that. And it's absolutely crushing it. You know, what's going on in the broader market has nothing to do with it. And then I was out in Los Angeles a few days ago talking to one of my partners, you know, that focuses on the consumer side of things and, you know, consumer discretion. And, and uh, you know, they're really facing some headwinds. So you, you really have to, in our market, dig down a little deeper. It's hard to make the broad brush, brush statements other than uncertainty. And then the second thing I would mention in, in the I think it was talked about a tad earlier is just the cost of debt. I mean, debt drives so much of these markets and, and, you know, uh, at the big end of the market, when you're putting five, six, eight time, times leverage, those markets are, you know, uh, a lot less buoyant than they were. Just the impact of the pricing, you know, is a lot, is a lot more harmful. Uh, our guys are usually in the two to three times leverage. Haven't seen as much of it, but a lot more, what we're hearing is a lot more, uh, a lot more careful review by the various credit providers. I think the other thing that, that's really, really important is, you know, years ago, you know, before the global financial crisis, most of the 
debt was coming from, you know, bank and bank like institutions. But over the last 10 years, 15 years, we've seen an explosion of private debt providers. So there's still a ton of, of debt liquidity out there. Uh, obviously, higher pricing, I think a little tighter just in underwriting and, and, and final approvals. But, you know, I don't think we're going to see the kind of vast yo-yo swings that you would see when you were solely dependent on the bank market. Good point. Good point. Sal, what are you seeing? I, I think, you know, we, we've been in a leveraged society now for about 20 years, and we've never seen a hike in interest rates since, like this since, what, 1994? And even on the real estate side, we're still sitting and we're not doing anything yet because it just seemed, we did one real estate deal that we talked about that was 166,000 square foot um, class A industrial family with a very prominent Southern California family, but that's it because there's opportunistic stuff coming. And right now I think we're just waiting to see how is that Tusami of 300 basis points since February, right? Could be more, could be another 50, 75 on the betting sites you look at, right? People are betting on that. Uh, that's going to have that that's already had material ramifications for housing right that's always going to be the sing, you know the the sacrificial lamb with the higher interest rates but you're also going to see a lot of other asset classes i think start to get hammered because a lot of people you know cheap debt sort of hit a lot of flaws on on people and you have a lot of bad operators that reared their head who probably paid the last dollar for certain asset classes in real estate say so that's going to be interesting to see how they're managing that yes yeah oh. Could you guys just repeat the question? I apologize, can't. Yeah, hear it. so there's a, there's a demographic shift Marty's talking about where you have a lot of baby boomers that are selling their business. 20% of people actually are able to afford to sell their business and actually 20% of that actually get the bid that they want. Is that what you're saying? Okay, about 4% in total, correct. Of course, because of interest rates. Yeah, interest rates are gonna clobber valuations on businesses. It's just, it, it's, it's a universal law. And so that's gonna affect valuation too. Yeah, that's gonna to affect a lot of valuation too. If you can't get stuff in time, it's a big deal. Depends are on are you seeing better opportunities now? We, we've been actually sharpening our ax, if that makes sense. And the way we play this game is the way I've done it for years is that we set up separate um, equity facilities that are dedicated to sponsors. And the way we look at the sponsors is that they have to qualify three rules. Number one, they have to have an audited track record. If their track record's so great, get it audited. Number two, I wanna see a meaningful equity contribution. 5% is cute, 10% thoughtful. Uh, the one we did in, uh, in industrial here in Las Vegas, they had 40% down because they're a real operating family office throwing off a lot. That gives my investors you know, a lot of, you know, makes them feel good at night. And also some investors who don't understand the asset class, it's perfect to bring them into, right? Sort of like more sacred, what we call mother-in-law money, right? You don't want to lose your mother-in-law's money. So you have to be very careful about what you put this money into. And then the last one is that I wanted them to see to go through at least two economic down cycles. So 2008 was one, but I want to go back further to like late 90s, you know, 2000s, because that really shows that they have the, you know, the determination and, and the grit to work with lenders, you know, they're, they're, they're laying in a pool of their own sweat, they've done it before, and they're going to be able to emerge because they have the network of the resources to be able to do so. Do you think people are going to want to have longer hold periods of assets? What's your typical? Hold yeah, period? I think so. The hold period right now for these are, well, we're actually being paid off this year, I think, in, in 12 months on this one real estate deal. And then after that, we're just collecting coupons after that. But the, the people who want to get into these types of class A statement assets, they want it for the long term. They're not there. They're, they're already wealthy. They're looking to put their wealth somewhere. It's not for them that they're in wealth creation mode where they're investing into like a value added apartment deal or, or something similar to that. These are people that got to put money somewhere. And if they don't put it in real estate, we just send it to Alan, to be honest with you, Alan Snyder yesterday, because it's a good real estate replacement. And then the, you know, the agreement is, is, you know, if we see something interesting, you know, the, Alan has a full liquidity provision after a year. So it works out very, very well. It's a good, like little mousetrap for us. Uh, yeah. Almost like cash. Yeah. We, we have a question over here. From, yes. Tom. This,
Yeah, so when we're dealing with offices, I, yeah, so uh, Tom Forrest, who's the CEO of Thrive, one of our favorite CEOs, asked Life Science Company, you know, when you're talking to family offices, does it require a different type of conversation? And the answer is yes, because you really want to get to the heart of what it is, and that's the story behind it. You want people to get behind the story. And if you look at a lot of companies today, a lot of people who make direct investments, they treat their um, they treat their garden as if it's like a garden of succulents, right? You have to have more than just water every month. The water's the capital that comes in. You have to have a strong foundation. That's the network. That's the CEO's network and its ability to, to grow the, the whole foundation. But what a lot of people don't put is the sunshine. And right now what we've done is for all of our portfolio companies, because we hold these, we're not broker dealers, is that we have um, a full slated uh, public relations um, platform that we put together so that these CEOs can tell their story. I was a pre-med major in college. I know, you know, biology and history, never made it to medical school. But I can tell you that I have an intellectual curiosity because I like biology, but families don't. And you need to be able, nobody wants to sit through biology class. And unless you come to Marty's, nobody does, even math class too. So we've put it in a way where we're able to show a story, but to show leadership and authority in a way. I'm actually flanked by Christine Haas over here, who's our publicist for HRN, but also for Thrive as well. And that kind of video actually speaks to people. But it's not just that too, is that we, we, are, we are in a very conspicuous generation today. And we've done this with my you know, real estate deals and some highlight reels for what we've done, is that those reels get forwarded around and around and around. And then people wanna be a part of that because you're one of the stories that they understand that no one else can understand. And you know, as I said before, life sciences, is, is, it's, it has a tremendous amount of legitimacy for the investors and the families, but you have to communicate it to them in a way where they actually respect it so that they can write the check and get excited about it. You hang out with Sal, you, go, <laughs> you subscribe to Sal at hrn.llc. You can go uh, and I'll add you to the list. But we have a lot of families that I've worked with and the function be behind actually HRN is because a lot of the real estate families that I had started moving over to life sciences because they were saying, okay, Sal, you know, you, you, you don't like all these real estate deals. Things are getting kind of overpriced. What are you doing? Funny you should ask. And then we tell, start telling the story that way. I find that the real estate investors are the ones who are going to be the ones that are looking. They're, they're mostly providers, but if they're successful, they're going to be the ones that are going to write the check because they're looking Real estate gets boring after a while. Let's let you, it, honest, I mean, you and I are in the same business, you know, but, but the point is it gets a little boring and these people want to be known for something else. And they want to be known for being something and saying, hey, I'm investing in this company that's going to be able to make, um, it's, you know, impact the lives of millions of people immediately because of whether it's drug discovery or it's oncological or anything related to it. That's sort of to them is like a piece of like the immortality that Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk has by traveling to Mars or, you know, to extra, you know, extraterrestrial space exploration. Charles, turning to you, but I know this is some, oh, Marty. Well, the, que the question is, and, and Charles, maybe you can answer this, is are people building in contingencies in their investment structure or, or is that the question? What, what, what contingencies should you be building in to your direct investments? Charles? Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, I didn't know if the question was going on. Uh, you know, Interestingly, um, what comes to mind is is working with our sponsors during, um, you know, the whole COVID crisis. And what they immediately did was they went out and got as much liquidity as they could because they really didn't understand, you know, the long term impacts of all this. And they knew they were going to, you know, they were going to, you know, be in an uncertain environment with uncertain, you know, ability to predict their revenue. And their and their expense side, so uh, building liquidity. You know, we saw a ton of that. Everybody was doing that. We're seeing guys do that here as well. Uh, we've seen a lot of our families pull back. You know, instead of averaging a two hundred fifty or five hundred thousand in investment, they're they're maybe cutting that in half. And and it's not because they're illiquid. It's because um, you know there's this this uncertainty. And so I just think people, a lot of our families, just want to be prepared. 
you know, uh, are we going to, you know, have a, a nice rebound next year or is it just going to, the economy going to fall off the rails? And so that's this uncertainty. And I think when people are uncertain, they tend to pull back and uh, they tend to build liquidity. We're certainly seeing that. Um, we're, uh, you know, we're doing that ourselves. Uh, our sponsors are are doing the same thing. You know, they're, I think everyone is in this, you know, kind of a little bit of a cautious mode and making certain they have, you know, kind of cash to weather the storm. Marty, were you um, asking also about contingencies and purchase agreements? John, that might be a, a good thing for you to talk about. And you might repeat the question. Sure. So the question is, I think, from two points. If you're making a direct investment or making an investment, what type of contingencies or protections, I'll use that word, might you try to build in? And then I would take the other side of it and tell you what we're seeing investors do in some of our companies, right? So I think uh, there is definitely more emphasis on the earnout dynamic, you know, putting in, as Marty uh, termed it, performance causes. I think one of the things you could do as a direct investor to think about, uh, there may be some give and take here, but if, if there's some daylight between you and, and the, the um, target's perception evaluation, you can say, look, if you hit these targets over these three years, we'll honor that. We have a transaction right now. Uh, the multiple is going to range between 17 and 27 times EBITDA, depending on the performance of the company in the next three years. But it was a way that we can we could manage our clients' expectation. It's obviously a high growth firm. Expectation of what their value was and the investor's comfort level with writing a, you know, a significant check with some unknown or some uncertainty. So I think you, we're in a climate where you can absolutely ask for um, uh, earn out, uh, you know, and you can be thoughtful about what those performance metrics, you know, you know, might be obviously revenues. And I, I prefer revenue from my standpoint, because it's straightforward, but uh, we're definitely seeing that. And I definitely think that uh, it could be a way that you could, because ultimately, and it's interesting, because this large PE group said, we really hope they hit all these earnouts. we really hope to pay this price, because our ownership in the company will be worth so much more. And so it can be, uh, I think, a, a mutually beneficial structure for you, for you to use. Yeah, I would add seller notes too. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree. Just from experience, if you're making fund investments, if the fund has any redemptions, you would want to be noticed uh, um, as soon as possible, especially a real estate fund. Yeah, that's. Yeah, yeah, you're going to see a lot of that, too. I'm sorry, what, what's. Right. Right. Secondary sales of limited partnership interests. Yes, I mean, you definitely should look at that. Of course, um, most closed-in funds restrict that pretty heavily. Um, but yeah, if they get longer in the, uh, in the uh, and you have GP-led secondaries, which is a hot issue with the SEC right now. They really don't like those. Um, but George, are you, are you talking about continuation vehicles? Yes, or even, uh, you know, a family that wants to sell its position in, in one of your fund of funds or get out of the program. Um, and whether it's, you know, do you help them find liquidity? I mean, look, it's a, the, I can talk about the secondary market briefly in, in what we do, but 
it's a it's a much more robust market now than it's ever been. Uh, a lot of people are always asking us about buying fund positions and buying individual co-investment positions from our partners. I think a lot of a lot of groups really like the ability to uh, miss the J curve, you know, buy after the J curve. And, you know, most likely they're going to have a lower times capital, but they might have a higher IRR. And there's a lot of groups out there that, that want that. What we've seen recently with these secondary guys, they've gotten uh, the, the, their pricing really gotten a lot more expensive. So whereas, you know, 1.3x to 1.5x was, was what they were talking about. Now we're seeing 1.5 to two times. Because I, I just think that they think, look, if someone needs liquidity in private equity, that means they probably need it pretty badly. And therefore, we're going to get paid for it. And so I, I, I think the number of transactions are slowing there based on, you know, some of the groups I'm talking to. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, look, it's, I think it's great. I, I wish there were a lot more options for liquidity in, in the private markets. I mean, liquidity, lack of liquidity is not risk. It's a certainty. And, and I think that's what we all get paid for in this market. One of the key things we get paid for is, is how to manage this illiquidity. And I, I would love there to be more robust options for uh, liquidity in the, in the secondary market. And, I'm, you know, there's a lot more of it, a lot more folks chasing that. I've just seen their pricing get, you know, pretty aggressive in the last, I mean, literally the last three months. I've seen a significant uptick in the pricing on on getting deals done, and 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 consequently, there hasn't gotten any deals done. You know, they've all fallen apart. Five minutes left. So, um, one thing that Marty wanted me to address is whether families should lead co-invest deals, or whether they're better off going with a registered investment advisor like Charles. Um, you know, I hate to, to be the, uh, the devil's advocate, but the SEC is going to look and, and particularly state regulators are focused on, you know, country club deals where people are passing the hat, but somebody's getting a fee or a promote out of it. And they're not registered as a broker dealer or an investment advisor. So when families lead deals, they have to be very careful that they're complying with both state and federal securities regulations, which is why it's better to go through a registered broker dealer or a registered investment advisor. Well, yes, absolutely. Right, right. You don't want to put your, be the nail that sticks its head up. Um, absolutely. And state regulators are looking at that. Um, not to be political, but that's what our current attorney general got in trouble for and is under indictment for. Um, hasn't hasn't hurt him so far, um, but yeah, you uh, you do jeopardize your family office exemption once you start to lead deals or sponsor deals and take fees. Not taking fees; it's a whole different situation. Well, generally speaking, generally, generally, yeah, generally speaking, if you're okay. If you're getting expense reimbursements, that's that, something different. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it, it could be fees. It could be kickbacks from from the you know the firm that's you're investing in that sort of thing. It, just to add on to this, I mean, from the negative situations I've seen occur, I always just encourage people. I know there's a huge focus on the cost and the fees and go direct, but sometimes you would much rather have paid a fee than to deal with the complexity, the regulatory review, all of that. So I just I always encourage families or people to, you know, make sure you've got skill there and make sure that there's actually a really a beneficial reason for this approach you're taking. Also, you have the, you're the right person like you, not like their college buddy who doesn't know any better. So there's there's a big difference there, right? Sure. Just not all broker dealers are made the same. Okay. Absolutely. Question. Absolutely. Do we have time for one, one more topic? So um, a related topic is uh, Sal, you you wanted me to ask you about how you communicate with your family offices. How much handholding do they want? We, we built HRN during the pandemic and the reason for it is because it, we didn't think we were gonna see each other anymore. And when you're working with families, and you, you can write this down, interactivity is a new currency. And so we have about right now, probably about 
50 families that are legitimate families that we provide coverage meaning like traditional coverage banking for like we're on top of them all the time i know them well you know i text them all the time you know they follow me on instagram and what we also do is i not a lot of people know this but i mentioned before i've been an amateur copywriter for about 14 years and we are big on email and I like sending emails out to people that get open and read because it continues the narrative and invites them into the community. What these people are looking for today is to join a cabal that has similar shared values as they do. And that's what we're able to do through the email and the technology and the publicity and everything. We invite them to become part of the story. Because again, remember, we're not broker dealers, we're portfolioing these. So we have to show conviction too. And that's one of the ways that we do it. Yeah, and um, Charles, any anything you want to add there as far as keeping in touch with your families you work with? You know, um, because we uh, are pretty active originating deals to them where we're, we have a new deal every, you know, few weeks. That's the primary way we're interacting. We're always talking about a company. Of course, when you're talking about a current company, uh, oftentimes they're asking you questions about the last company or maybe a company five years ago. And so our ecosystem is all, uh, you know, is all really based around um, the companies. And, and so that's what we're always talking about. And, and we're in these companies alongside them, you know. So uh, like Sal was saying, we're, we're right in there with them. We're investing our own money in these companies, too. We're always talking about the companies. We get flash reports from companies. Something really good happens. You know, we let them know. We have, you know, very proactive quarterly reports. And, and calls where all the investors jump on and it's a kind of a free form discussion about the state of the market. Then we literally go through, you know, every company. And so for us, it's all about the, it's all about the companies. Uh, we did candidly about, let's see, it was March of 2020. We actually started something new in our office and because uh, we're thinking, what can we do for our partners? All these, especially our sponsors who, you know, are out there trying to save their companies. This was pre PPP and there, no one knew what was going on is, is we actually opened up, up our phone line and at noon, we just start praying for our partners. So we prayed for our partners every day. It's, it's interesting. We continue to do that to this day. It's probably been the best thing we've done and we get our partners joining us and it's really been a great way to build camaraderie and get to know your partners better. So those are kind of the two things we've done really always talking about, about the companies and then candidly, you know, praying for our partners. Interesting. That's, that's great. Thanks. 